Welcome to the inaugural keynote for the 2013 School Leadership Summit. So delighted to have Dr. Bill Brennan here with us. Bill, welcome. Thank, thank you, Steve. <laughs> what a fun day coming up. Really excited about this. This is a reminder to me to start the recording, but we're good to go. Thanks to our sponsors and supporters for this event, especially to TCAL for their terrific willingness to step up and really make this happen. And for our keynote, we want to express some special appreciation to Asia, the Asia Society for their encouragement and their support. So this is a chance for those of you participating to let us know where you're participating from. Look to the left of the map. You're looking for some icons. The second one down is a star. You double click on that, and then you click on the map. And it's fun for you to put into the chat the time, the temperature, anything else you'd like to tell us about where you are. I'm in Barron, Utah, Australia, between Sydney and Melbourne. And it is coming up just past 1 in the morning, and I'm looking forward to staying awake for the next 14 hours. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, please feel free to keep the uh, information flowing in the chat as to where you're listening from. And I'm going to turn the time over to Bill. Thanks so much for doing this, Bill. Steve, uh, it's it's my pleasure. And uh, what, what, a, what a groundbreaking event. Um, you know, it's just amazing the work that you're doing and, and the impact that this is having on education. Um, I, you know, I want to start off by saying, and good morning, but Steve, considering where you're coming from and where a number of our participants are, good afternoon and good evening, um, you know, to many of our friends and learners around the world. Um, welcome to the Global School Leadership Summit. This is just a, a wonderful event. It's an honor to be a part of this event, and um, I'd like to just kind of remind you of some of the hashtags that we're using. I'm trying to follow the uh, Twitter chat as well. Uh, we're using SLS13. And uh, I also um, look forward to connecting with uh, many of you um, over Twitter. Uh, my handle there is Dr. Bill Brennan, and uh, so that we can continue this important work and conversation uh, for the time to come. So I'm actually going to be talking a little bit about intelligence um, and kind of the convergence of technology and why I believe that today we have, I think, the ability to accelerate our own intelligence. And I also think is that we look at organizations as individuals and various systems. I believe that we also have the capacity to accelerate organizational intelligence. Um, you know, and I, I kind of wonder here, just imagine, what would it, mean, what would it be like? Um, what, what might this mean if our entire schools or all schools were committed to real-time learning using modern tools like this new social infrastructure? And, um, you know, what are some of the drivers that, that will help us get there? But before we do that, I think I kind of want to go through a couple questions. You know, is this happening in our schools? What does professional learning look like? And is there an acceptable level of professional capital in our organizations today? And then what, one of the things that intrigues me is what does the social structure look like in your schools, in our schools, between our schools, and then perhaps with all the knowledge in the world? Um, and what are we doing as leaders to accelerate both organizational capacity and um, an interesting idea here, uh, our bandwidth for change or cha change bandwidth. These are kind of all the things that I want to talk about. And this was something that I was interested in years ago, um, still continue to be very interested in. And um, it turned out that um, I had done some doctoral work at a Fordham University, which is how I arrived at this notion of uh, unleashing the next generation learning organization. We're going to talk a lot about the social media aspect of accelerating intelligence and kind of sharing a lot of personal stories of my own. You know, I'd encourage you, too, as, as I go through here and talk, um, but to, to chime in in the chat section and, and tweet out as much as possible. Um, but I wanted to give you some background on this. So about four years ago, I enrolled in Fordham University's doctorate program for ed leadership. And I was always passionate about using social media and education, but yet sometimes frustrated by um, the difficulty in doing so and using it, whether as an administrator or, or a teacher, uh, and, and for kids. So I sought to study kind of the really important people in the organization, school principals, and um, what virtual learning really meant uh, to them. 
and it was um, just a fantastic experience. Um, you know, some of the findings from this I think were just profound, and some of the work that these principals are doing is just kind of earth-shattering, and, and it's something to really pay attention to. But it was interesting in terms of talking about social media. You know, you get that stigma with social media. So, you know, a lot of the research points to this notion of virtual communities of practice. And for the purpose of my study, it was a place where this informal learn learning takes place and where groups of people are drawn together by a strength or interest. And I, I, what I kind of led to here is the notion that social media allows for the creation of virtual communities of practice. It almost sounds like a, a better word, virtual communities of practice, sometimes because of the stigma. And within any study, you have conceptual framework. So I want to give you some background on this. Um, I just finished this uh, last semester, so that was in December. And the conceptual frameworks um, happen to be social network theory and social capital. And one of the things that we know about social network theory is that social capital is such an important thing. And I just started to think about it, social capital before we had social media. And I think about social capital when we have social media and the importance of this, almost the social capital 2.0, um, you know, to the extent where our virtual connections um, allow us to access resources through relationships and the social structure of uh, social media, which kind of uh, allow us to be a bit more um, um, of an impact in, in our organizations. So let me just move on to this. So we get into this idea of, in, of intelligence. And if you could, maybe use the chat session right there. I'd like some folks just to kind of share in what, what you might think intelligence, your definition of intelligence might be. And I'll just I'll wait a few seconds as we watch some of the um, definitions come in. Because it was a couple days ago that I had kind of stumbled upon this. And that seems to happen a lot in social media. Um, you know, and, and I've heard people refer to this, and I've experienced it myself in terms of these serendipitous learning experiences that happen. I, Peggy says, knowing how to learn, what, what a great point. Wow, these are all, these are all amazing. I wish I can keep up. So let me, let me jump in here and just throw out what I had discovered. A kind of a, a practical or just a, something that makes sense. And so Stephen Hawking's here, it was the image that I had seen and through my social networks was intelligence is the ability to adapt to change. And I think about this word change and I think about what we're going through right now in education. And again, what comes to mind when we hear these words change and adapt? You know, it's, we're always throwing these words around uh, in education. Um, but I want to kind of e examine these for a little bit. And in order to do that, you know, I think we almost have to talk about the elephant in the room. Now, I'm, I'm a school district director of uh, instructional technology in New York. Um, we're going through some interesting changes right now. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, I imagine some of those changes are happening across the country. Um, some good, some bad. And I don't necessarily want to get into that, but we have to be aware of what's going on here. And at the same time, you know, I, I captured this slide. One of my good friends, Adam Bello, had shared this on one of his travels um, when he was out doing a presentation on um, sharing on Facebook. And I just thought this was really neat, too. Um, don't really know classes this week due to state assessments. We'll resume real education in two weeks. It is said, and it is true. Um, I'm, I'm a father of, I have three kids under a four, a four-year-old, two-year-old, and a seven-week-old. And, you know, it, it, it does make me think, you know, about what I want their learning experience to be like. So in the midst of all of this, in, in the midst of this um, external accountability, we also have, well, here, here's another example of what's going on. You know, this, this situation where our, ch you know, children are being forced to take, you know, the same exams and, and perform on the same exams, you know, and I think this, little comic here um, highlights that, you know, and, and we all know from kids and just, just from learning in general that, you know, we all do it differently. And I'm not quite sure that the current system is, you know, really the way it should be. But um, let me just throw in now the real context of what's happening now with social media and what's happening to the world in terms of technology, innovation, and change. And interestingly, how do we fit? This is one of the things I wrestle with all the time. 
how do we fit this um, this this spot here? You know, what what our children are doing into the infrastructure, into what our institutions are doing um, right now in education, or being forced to do in terms of external accountability. I, I struggle with that, um, and but but every day it's one of those things that just keeps you up all night. Trying to, trying to figure out, and that was one of the things that my study sought to do. It was to get in touch with the brightest and best principals in this country that are using technology as a way to accelerate organizational capacity. Um, and, and I want to share a little bit of those stories, but more importantly, I want to share kind of what the essence of that experience was for these principles. Um, and that comes through what I had done was a phenomenological study, um, which really uh, tries to get to the essence of this experience. You know, one, one of the participants in the study had said this, you know, and I've, I've, I've heard this many times after. We're living and working in a world where we don't even know what we don't know. You know, this is so true. And I think about this, and I wonder, well, how do we keep up with this? What does learning have to look like? What do our organizations have to be doing? What do our teachers have to be doing? What sort of structures should we have in place? What, what sort of structures should we not have in place uh, in order to um, keep up with this, this, this piece here? You know, I had a great fortune of talking with John Seeley Brown at the 2012 PLP Live conference. Um, and, you know, he talks a lot about the social infrastructure and how it's driving innovation. And simply at a pace that schools are really struggling to keep up with. And, um, you know, I, I mentioned this idea of professional learning, but I think we also have to challenge our, you know, the structure and architecture of organizations, how we communicate, with who we communicate, and when we communicate. And I want to get into all that shortly. And, and one of the things that John Seeley Brown kind of spoke about was this notion of the printing press and what it did. It ended up changing, you know, changing the world. Uh, just like the TV ended up changing the world. But the Internet is actually doing something a little bit different. Not only do we have the access to, you know, the information and knowledge, but we really do have the access to the intelligence in other people's minds. And I want to share with you this, some of the stories that I've um, encountered along the way for that. Scott is one of the ones where, where I heard him say this. Uh, what an amazing person to follow on Facebook. Um, great guy to stay in touch with. We're in a shift from the digital age to an age of networked intelligence. Uh, you know, that kind of statement there um, resonated with me. And I wonder what's more important. You know, we talk about the learning, but what about the unlearning? You know, um, which is more important? Well, they're both important because through learning we become more capable of unlearning as we, you know, um, are constantly engaged in the learning experience. We, we tend to challenge our beliefs, our perspectives, and um, ideologies, and perhaps unlearning comes as a result of that. But again, one of the questions I sought to um, uncover or, or answer here was, how will the new social infrastructure help schools adapt to this change? You know, how do we take a system of this external accountability amidst the um, Technology innovation, where all we're doing is, you know, constantly getting quicker and quicker at innovating and, and creating opportunities for learning, or authentic learning, I should say. And I think that at the heart of this is a couple things. Number one, our schools, we need a renewed commitment to learning, but in scalable ways, not ways that happen every third Tuesday a month when we go to a professional development session or our PLC. And I, I, Peggy, absolutely, unlearning is much harder than it sounds. Um, but thank you for that comment. Um, the deeply grained assumptions about leadership and learning is, um, is a very hard thing to do and to, to change. But I would argue that social media plays a huge role in that. And one of the questions I would ask is, how do we increase our rate of unlearning? Not necessarily learning, but how do we increase our rate of unlearning? And one of the things that I had discovered through my conversations with these principals in this study was that the schools that I learned fast have really more individuals that are constantly learning or constantly engaged in the context. Because what they're doing is they're constantly discovering ideas that they never thought of. Um, you know, I think about my time in social media and whether it be Facebook or Twitter or anything else, and just all of the discoveries that I've made or the things that I've discovered that I didn't even know that I didn't know. So 
I'd like to introduce you to a couple metaphors that I've arrived at through this study and through the help of um, some other people that I've run into along the way. And I think it helps describe or capture the essence of what social media could be doing for education. And what are some of the challenges and pitfalls and things like that that we need to be aware of in order to move forward? So I hope you're into uh, aquatic sports and, or, or sports in general, because I'm going to introduce to a, a few metaphors that I've even start, started to write about on my blog um, at wbrennan.wordpress.com. And I hope to commit to more, more of that. But, you know, the sport of surfing, um, you know, before, before I had kids and a well, job and, and all that other responsibility, I enjoyed the sport of surfing. And, you know, if, if you're surfing, and, um, you know, it's one of those things that as you paddle out and you look around and you go to catch a wave, you're constantly engaged in that experience. Um, you're constantly engaged in the context of the uh, experience. It's not that third Tuesday of the month, I say, of PD where we, we're going to go learn and someone's going to talk to us. You're always in, you know, engaged in that. You're always connecting with individuals of like minds, and I think that's one of the most powerful things about social media. And if we think of you know, learning as constant engagement, you know, I think we have to think about this notion of um, how do schools go through a profound change in how, when, and from whom they learn. So one of the things that I love about social media is it, it's not a third Tuesday of the month. It's whenever I look at my um, Twitter feed or Facebook wall, and it happens in, in small increments. It's, you know, one minute or two minutes or three minutes here or there. And they all seem to be powerful experiences. And that brought me back to kind of one of the findings of my study here, which was this idea that social networking, the people with whom we connect, both inside and outside of our organizations, no, I'm sorry to interrupt, really Bill. does lead to We're getting a number of people who are capital. dropping off because of bandwidth. So and can I ask you to turn your video off? Social capital. That would Steve, be great. And question? again, I apologize for the interruption. Keep going. You're doing a great job. Thank you, Steve. And, and I was having a bad hair day, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. <laughs> um, so let me, let me get back to here. Uh, this idea of social networking that builds social capital. You know, I, I just think about the people that I've interacted with in the school setting, you know, uh, pre-social media and what that's led to. But then I compare that to what, what I've been able to do and learn and what have some of my other uh, fellow colleagues have been able to do and learn and the pace at which we're able to learn through these social spaces. And it doesn't just stop. It's, it's kind of a constant stream of, of, of knowledge, which we'll talk about in a little bit. You know, and this idea of what are we learning about and what a great example this is today. You know, who are you learning with? And, you know, is this, what does traditional PD look like in schools today? Um, because, you know, I mean, here we are right now. This is kind of what we're doing. And, and when we speak of the aspect of social media, um, it's great. It's really wonderful that, that perhaps we'll all maintain some sort of connection down the road through Twitter or through Facebook or LinkedIn and, and we can engage in um, you know, knowledge exchanges along the way um, because, you know, we're of like minds. We're here for a reason. Um, one of my participants is I like to hang out with the believers, not the non-believers. That was uh, powerful, I thought. So let me just take a, kind of a walk through here. Um, in regards to some of the people a number of years ago that I had kind of started to follow and how I got turned on to this entire notion um, of social capital 2.0, if you will. Um, you know, here's a slide of Tony Wagner who wrote the book, The Global Achievement Gap. And, you know, why just read a book? Why not follow Tony? Um, and the same goes for, um, you know, John Seeley Brown, who, if, if you haven't read this book, um, please, please pick this up. The power of quote is just um, mind-blowing. Um, John Seeley Brown is one of the, the smartest people I've ever met in my, in my life, and you know I had the great opportunity, thanks to PLP Live 2012, to um, actually sit and talk with him. And then you know examples of somebody like Sir Kenneth Robinson. You know if you want to stay in his network, in his you know in his loop, you know follow him on Twitter, or follow him on Facebook. But I find that many you know many educators don't necessarily you know jump onto this because we look at social media in, in a different type of way, which, which I'll talk about in a second. And then, you know, an example of Michael Fulham, who's, who's actually coming out with a, one of his new books called The Stratosphere. This is one of the other books, Professional Capital. But just the ability to follow these, these minds, you know, and I think about it, you know, I'm a full-time 
employee in a school district. Um, you know, I have three kids and, and other responsibilities. And although I'm extremely passionate about what I'm doing, I don't have the time to, you know, in order to do all of this, I have the time to constantly be, you know, reading books, or reading this, or reading that at the pace we would like. I shouldn't say we don't have time to do it, but at the pace we'd like. So why not connect with the greatest minds and ideas in the world? John Silly Brown refers to that as learning on the edge, at the, at the, at the, the edge of learning. And um, he talks about that in his book, The Power of Pull. So those are kind of some of the people that I started following and started making these connections to and building my, my um, you know, social capital, if you will, but enhancing knowledge exchanges. But then I got into my study, you know, and then I got into this, this notion of principles and virtual learning and really kind of, you know, getting down to the, the, the deep meaning of this sort of stuff. And I figured, let me follow, you know, some, some different people. And, um, you know, I, I refer to these folks as, as my BFF sometimes. Um, but, um, you know, Will Richardson, George Siemens, Eric uh, Scheniger, Scott McLeod, and um, you know, George Carlos, you know, just think about it. I, I had the opportunity to learn with these folks and, and many, many, many more, um, which really did accelerate my learning in many different ways. And then finally, Don Tapscott, who's another great mind that perhaps we should all connect with. Um, the book Macro uh, Wikinomics is a great book, but, you know, one of the things um, about Don and, and some of the greater uh, presenters that are traveling the world and, you know, talking about this sort of stuff have the opportunity, while they're not necessarily, you know, working in the schools every day, to connect with the greatest minds, to share the greatest information or the best information. So let me just share something with you that was just awesome for me. Um, and, and, again, this is one of those epiphanies. It was... Um, you know, I had one of those epiphanies years ago, but this, it happened again. And as I tell the story, I still kind of get chills. Um, but I had just finished in October my chapter five, the final, as I said, most fun chapter of the dissertation. And I just wanted to give a special thanks to some of the greatest thinkers in the world who are part of my learning network. And, you know, I, I really did mine with them. You know, they served as valuable mentors through my dissertation process, which is, is often a difficult one. And, uh, one that you constantly need pushing with and, and fuel, if you will, and social media was a great way to do that. But I woke up the next morning, and I get a message from Don Tapscott saying, please email Jody at Tapscott.com and ask her for a copy of this paper. And again, it, it, if you go back to that notion of social network theory and social capital and what this, this, um, these connections create, this was a powerful learning experience for me as a researcher for me as an educator, and I just wonder, you know, I, part of my study was wondering how do we create these environments, these opportunities for professional learning in our schools, and then replicate them in the classroom for, uh, you know, for kids. Just uh, slide down here. So, I want to just kind of um, capture the essence of this, and, and one of the things that I wrote about in my um, dissertation and, and what I'm writing about um, in, in a book that I'm working on, is I think about the learning, kind of the stuff that I just explained and what social media has done for me and done for, for all of us, about the learning I've done in these spaces and how it's closely related to what's happening in this picture. Now, does anybody know what's happening in this picture? Wondering if you can just kind of type in there in the chat session. Uh, Blanca, that's funny. That's coming up, though. You know that. Oh, yeah, we got a lot of triathletes here. Um, well, you're correct. This, this is the start of a triathlon. Uh, it actually is the start of uh, an Ironman. And, um, you know, about 40 pounds ago, um, I was a triathlete, uh, formerly a college swimmer. And, um, you know, in, in triathlons, in um, open water swimming, if you will, you know, there, most people are not up at the front. But there's actually an advantage, believe it or not, to being in the middle of the pack or even in the back or in any other place besides the front. Because what happens is you almost reduce your drag force. You know, swimming, there's a huge drag force that comes along and it, because water is a lot uh, more dense and resistant than, than air. So when you start getting behind people in swimming and when it's a mass of this size, you create this amazing draft. And what I like to say is that it's really about reducing your resistance. And I think about the learning that I've done in my own virtual communities and how it's kind of reduced the resistance but accelerated me forward because of the people 
with whom I've been following. So the you know it's just, it's it's a matter of um, and I, here's here's the next slide. I'm sorry, but learning is drafting. You know, and um, it's very true. So if you hang on the back of somebody's foot, or you're four or five swimmers behind, um, you're you're essentially going to be kind of getting. I want to I don't want to say almost a free ride, but if you think about it, you know, if I'm learning with Tom Tapscott, with John Sewell Brown, with Eric Schoeninger, with George Carlos, with with all these brilliant people, just think about the learning that we can do and the way that it gets accelerated. I have a couple more um, metaphors to kind of share. I recently wrote about this too. Again, 40 or 50 pounds ago, maybe I was into the sport of triathlons, and um, you know, I, I always watch this, um, you know, this, the Tour de France. And, it, and actually, in triathlons, you're not really allowed to to draft, but um, you are in, in the Tour de France, and it's actually a strategy uh, in cycling. And they, they argue that there's about a 40% reduction in drag during certain parts of the race uh, when you're when you're in the peloton. And I think about that. And again, I think about this notion of learning as drafting. But I also think about there's leadership, but there's no one leader. Now, just think about that for a second. For years, we've been wrapped up in this higher RPL structure of schools, but yet we're getting away from that more and more, and we have to get away from that. Michael Fullen just recently talked down here on Long Island about leading from the middle, creating leadership amongst, among the organization. And again, I bring this idea of the Peloton because if we think about the group, you know, there, there is leadership, but there's no one leader. But there's a third point here, too. There's also a back and forth exchange of resources. And we can think of this as ideas in our world as educators or as learners. But in the Peloton, there's a shift. People shift roles. People move up. People move back. People move to the side. And they work as teams most of the time. Um, and I just think it's interesting and kind of helps explain the essence of the experience in, in social media spaces here. But what concerns me is this. This is what kind of concerns me. Again, I'm going back to a lot of nautical stuff. I have a confession. I was an ocean lifeguard for many years. Um, and um, I, I bring in a lot of, try to bring in a lot of metaphors that, that capture the, the nautical experience. But there might be two types of people, I fear, and two types of organizations. And I recently wrote about this as well. Um, the learned versus the learners. And you know, you can think of that in, in our organizations. And we think about that in the matter of professional capital. Um, you know, there are the learned who are just the learned, and then there are the ones that are constantly learning, who are constantly engaged in the experience, always seeking out new information and connections. And sure enough, you're probably familiar with this, but this is the idea of a rip current. And I'm just trying to read some of the comments. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, I believe a rip current happens to be a great metaphor for this and how individuals really perceive and react to this new age of networked intelligence. Uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned it earlier, but, you know, as we have shifted from a digital age to an age of networked intelligence, there's something significant here that we have the opportunity to kind of take advantage of. Um, you know, but I think about those individuals and I think about the organizations that struggle to kind of keep up with this force, and I wonder what you know what, what that'll mean. But I also kind of want to celebrate what some other people have done. You know, you've probably read this book many years ago. I've seen this book. It's a great one. It's a nice fable, short short read, quick read. But our iceberg is melting, and you know it, it's kind of this idea that um, you know there's there's a penguin, a colony of penguins, and and one penguin, I believe it was Fred, realizes that something's up, something is wrong, and about their iceberg is about to melt. And he goes through the whole process of change leadership and he tries to convince other people and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, he has a hard time doing that and that sort of stuff. But, but he really, really does believe that it's important to do. So, again, I think about that. And I, I remember reminded of something that came out of um, AERA over the summer, uh, the president of AERA. And I, I really do congratulate them on this. And, um, you know, bravo to them for, for doing this. But, um you know, they, they wrote this email um, about remembrance of academic things past. And, and just one of the comments that they made here was academics have really not adapted particularly well. And, um, you know, um, they, they perhaps might need to do that. So just coming out and clean about that is really important as, as organizations. But the question they pose, which is a great one, is what will AERA look like in 2025? And why assume what's happened to the newspaper industry will not happen to us in some sort of fashion? 
And I submit, one of the roles, I think, of the building principle and of the leadership, at least told from the, the perspective of the, the individuals that I studied, was this powerful message of why we need to change. It wasn't a what or a how. It was more about the why, and I'm going to talk about that shortly. But again, bravo to AERA and, and, and their work in doing that. Um, you know, doing that's not the easiest of things either. Um, you know, we see that in education. Um, you know, we've probably seen this slide before, but that big friggin' wall, you know, and, and the, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of questions or speculations about that big friggin' wall. But I want to focus in really in on the social media aspect of this um, because it's still frustrating. And it's interestingly interesting that of the 13 principals that I had interviewed, all who were just amazing, I have to tell you about 11 of them had, had written or had spoke about their struggles with getting social media used, the filtering and that sort of stuff in their schools. And I also wonder, well, who owns the power in the schools? You know, who, where is a you know, the principal not able to kind of use the tools or, or teach us not to use the tools? So we, we have some questions we got to figure out. You know, what are some of these common misconceptions about social media? And, and I hope these are getting much better um, when we, uh, you know, the, the further we go. And it would be great to share some stories about how we go about doing that. But I think about social media, and I think about a comment that one of the participants made in my study, which was a great one. And he said something to the extent like, you know, back in the day when we started putting playgrounds in, well, yeah, a lot of people would have been at the table or a couple people might have said, well, you know, people could get hurt. Somebody might fall and perhaps, you know, something bad could happen. You're absolutely correct. But the question is, we didn't, you know, the answer is we didn't stop putting playgrounds in schools or in our, in our neighborhoods or communities because, you know, we get, I think sometimes, and I'm, we get too often locked down in, in the liabilities and, 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 you know, what social media can, can do in terms of liabilities, but we forget to look at the opportunities that social media can create. And that's kind of the new story that all of us are trying to tell. Um, so, you know, I kind of like to use that example of, you know, we didn't stop putting in playgrounds because we, we knew kids would get hurt. Eventually they do. And it's, um, you know, we try to mitigate that risk, which is the most important thing. But, um, you know, we have to recognize there's power here. This is a slide that's probably that I've used for, for a while, but, you know, started getting out in the literature a number of years ago as soon as um, Karen got into um, her position here. And um, I, I applaud her for this because, you know, coming clean on this from her organization was so important. You know, because every school that I know, most schools that I know of face this challenge. And, you know, for them to come clean on this and just say, well, here's the reality. Here are the myths and then in the filtering. And, um, you know, hopefully that created some meaningful change in, in the way we do things in schools. Again, you know, one of the comments that came out of my study was how is social media, what is social media done for my learning? And, you know, I used the idea of a notepad here because this participant um, made, the, made the comments about it's kind of like, all the note taking that went on back in the day, but now that note, those notes are being shared. And, um, you know, he, he mentions how it's been an amazing way of note sharing to be able to read what countless of the principal school administrators and thought leaders are reading about and connecting with and what ideas they're wrestling with. And it's been invaluable, you know. So we've got to look at the positives of this and how we're going to use it to help our organizations or individuals grow. And that brings me to this. So. Again, one of the things, the great things that John Seeley Brown had, had talked to me about in, in his presentation, too, was this notion of do we learn more in knowledge stocks or do we learn more in knowledge flows? And he gets into this example of knowledge flows where, as organizations, um, you need to tap into that knowledge network, into those streams of knowledge. And it's, again, not that every third Tuesday of the month or, or whatever day of the week it might be, but you're constantly engaged in experience, tapping into the, the messages and ideas. And again, it's very simple that you know, that's just a matter of checking your Facebook feed, being intentional about who you follow on Twitter or a anything like that. Um, let me go to the uh, next slide, and which, which kind of goes into that. But one of the things that was a great point, I thought, was the cost of learning in the new social infrastructure is so low. It's so low. You know, we all have it. We all have the smartphones. We all have the access to these things. But the payoff is big. The payoff's huge. Um, and one of the one of the more powerful things about forget about the learning, but let's talk about the unlearning. And 
when you start sitting in these constant flows of knowledges and you get exposed to these perspectives and ideas that you probably normally wouldn't come in contact with. And I think what that does is kind of adds life, adds life to our learning and, and ways of thinking. And I think the more that we engage in those spaces, our spaces, our eyes will open up, will challenge our assumptions and beliefs. Uh, and I think this is a, a step in the right direction. I want to kind of share a personal story with you very shortly. Um, and it's really outside of education, but I think it has a lot to do with education. Um, and I'm reminded of this, you know, that this Web 2.0 idea is not necessarily just an audience, but it's a community. And more importantly, it's changed the way we access knowledge. You know, knowledge isn't between us. Um, it's, it's, it's never done. It's through the connections that we made. It's not just in our heads, but it's between us. And uh, social knowing is never finished, is what they say. So the example I want to share is something that my wife did. Um, my wife, uh, four years ago, um, probably a little uh, three years ago, um, started a blog. Now, my wife is extremely passionate about this idea of holistic uh, lifestyles and living. We had our son, Liam, he's now four years old, and, and she wanted to kind of explain, uh, well, first of all, she wanted to uh, connect with other people out there in the world who had similar interests to her. Because you can imagine, well, in, in Long Island, in New York, she doesn't find people on our block or she doesn't have people in our community that, you know, she's able to turn to for ideas. And this is important, huh? you know, just questions about different medicines and, and different ways to, you know, solve different remedies for, for our children. But so she wrote this blog. She created this blog called Raising Natural Kids. And she just wanted to get her voice out there. And she's a great writer, too, because she, well, she was an English teacher. But what's amazing is that Raising Natural Kids then had their own Facebook page. And what happened was the Facebook page kind of took off. And this kind of gave my wife and it gave all the other people, now 34,500 and something followers or likes, um, the opportunity to pose questions to, um, you know, questions that they may, not, they may not be getting the best answer from whoever they're seeing their doctor. They may not like that answer, but they want to challenge that question and that sort of thing. But they had a place to go. Community has been redefined by social media. And we see examples of this all over the web. I mean, look at Classroom 2.0 as an example of that um, and the work that Steve's doing. Raising Natural Kids for My Wife became this platform for her to kind of get her message out there, but to also empower people to make informed decisions about, you know, their kids. Uh, I'm waiting for her to release that Raising Natural Adults thing, but it's really just focused on the kids right now. Um, but, um, you know, she's doing a great job. And, and I think about that, and I think about you know, the wisdom that's out there on her network. And it's not a matter of the wisdom of the crowds, but it's the, the people that are part of the crowd and the sharing that goes on. And because of, because one is connecting to the crowd and being a part of the network, in a sense, they kind of get smarter. But this comes with the consideration of something that we have to embrace. You know, we have to embrace openness. If we're going to translate this into education, I think we have to start thinking about um, embracing radical openness and sharing and communicating and allowing teachers, administrators to have the tools in their hands. Um, you know, I, I also wonder, you know, we have PLC, PLCs is a great, great concept and it's a great idea and it does, there's great work going on. But I often ask the question, well, where do PLCs get their ideas from? You know, imagine if if our teachers and, and our educators and administrators were engaged in these spaces, constantly bringing the ideas from the edge of, of the learning into the core of the organization, which is something John C. Brown talks about in his book, The Power of Paul. Again, what does this mean for professional learning in schools? Uh, just a question I'm going to throw out there. And it kind of goes back to that idea where it's difficult to break these mental models or conceptual lenses. And I, and I often think of that, that tape recorder, that VHS cassette that goes off as soon as we have a conversation at times with, um, you know, just, just certain folks. But I think about, you know, living and learning in a uh, social network world, the way that, you know, the knowledge exchanges that I've been a part of have, have helped me challenge my own assumptions and beliefs um, and essentially broken some of the... Uh, mental models that I possess. So I think social media has got, you know, got huge potential in that. And, and one of the next things I want to share is, again, John Sealy Brown, I'm, I want to give him credit for this because this is something he also shared at the, the live conference. Um, if you just take a second to read this and maybe throw in an answer.
Yep, Jen, you're right, daylight. So um, the answer to the, this riddle is it, it is daylight and a uh, daytime. And um, uh, I will read it. It's see that some of you can't see it. A black dog is sleeping in the middle of a black road that has no street lights and there is no moon. A car coming down the road with its lights off steers around the dog. How did the driver know the dog was there? Well, it's because it was daytime, as we just said. So, um, you know, I think about that, and I think about that, that tape recorder, you know, that kind of mental model, the conceptual lens, or the way our mind kind of frames things. And what if we were to just kind of stop and think, you know, before we made any huge decisions, or before we kind of thought about the way we were going to do something, and try to do it through the lens of, of today, you know, and, and do things a little bit differently. Again, you know, the real difficulty, as many of you have seen in the chat sessions here, which is wonderful, is, um, you know, changing any enterprise lives, not developing new ideas, but really escaping the old ones. Um, and again, that was some of the powerful work that these principals were doing, and I want to just share a little bit about that. Um, and, and, and also the way that they're going about it, by the way, you know, in terms of the study, you know, um, it may not be that people necessarily fear the change as much as they fear being changed. And strategy in terms of leadership is, is probably one of the more important things in how you build the, the culture for that. And um, you know, that was one of the great things that, I, that came out of my, my study was the strategies and manners in which these, these uh, wonderful principles were doing that. Um, and, and one of the things that came out, I just recall, was the, um, the notion of you know, leading for their, their, their great people. I mean, trying to use the human capital that they have in, in place already to replicate, to share best practices, and um, you know, to put it out there in ways that would catch on to other people. And just the other day, um, I actually stumbled upon this as well, which is a great TED talk. So please, you know, jot this one down. I'll try to explain it real quickly. But uh, Simon here talks about how great leaders inspire, and he talks about this idea of the questions of what, how, and why. And perhaps, you know, sometimes leaders spend a lot of time in the um, what and how, but not enough in the why. And in his presentation, he gives an example about the, um, you know, about Apple and why they're so sex successful. And, um, you know, check that out on his TED Talk. But I want to just say that, you know, the principles, again, that I had interviewed that are leading these really innovative changes and, and, and faster than most, um, didn't necessarily get into the, the what and the how as much as they constantly talked about the why. And that's something that's really powerful. Um, because well, here, here's an example of the slide he talks about. Now, how do you explain when others are able to achieve things that seem to kind of defy well, assumptions? And some of the examples of these, you know, if you look and you read about, you know, what's going on in you know, the Philadelphia Science Leadership Academy and Burlington schools and Milford schools and Milford schools, and there's, there's, there's many, many, many other schools um, that are doing just wonderful things. But one of the things that have emerged is this idea of they're constantly talking about the why. Um, you know, they're not just talking about, well, there's these Web 2.0 tools. They're talking about the why and what the connections are that this makes to kids and to staff learning. Just, I, I'd like to go into it deeper, but please check out that TED Talk. It's really um, a wonderful talk. So I see I'm getting, it's about 10.44, and um, I'm probably getting close to the end, so I want to start kind of wrapping up here. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I think a lot of the principles that I'd spoken with recognized was that, yeah, we do have the internal accountability, I'm sorry, the external accountability forced down upon us. But, you know, it's, it's the work of creating the internal norms and the internal accountability that really makes a difference. And, um, you know, I saw a lot of that going on in the study as well. And I, I think just thinking back on this, thinking about the age of network intelligence and thinking about the opportunities that the social infrastructure affords us to accelerate our own intelligence and the intelligence of our organizations, I think we're at a turning point. And I think we can really start to rebuild our organizations, but it's going to kind of cause us to ditch some of the conventional wisdom that we've carried with us for so long. You know, as we think about internal capacity and the structures for professional learning, we have to stop thinking that we're going to be able to get all the resources or the knowledge from our internal sources. And one example I got through a friend of mine on LinkedIn was, we'll continue to squeeze the juice out of the lemon. So I think it's a lot about going outside our, our organizational boundaries to access information, to constantly attract that new information, and then to, to achieve, again, which is something John Seeley Brown talks about in his book. So the question remains, which, which door are we going to go in? You know, um, and 
in terms of some concluding thoughts, going back to the nautical theme here, again, it's something that I used to love to do, um, surfing. And in 2011, um, the Quicksilver Pro New York contest came to Long Island. And that's a big thing. Because Long Island's hit or miss. You know, you're going to either have waves or you're not going to have waves. And there's Kelly Slater getting some air. Um, but funny, uh, for about the week before this event down in Long Beach, the ocean was completely flat, completely flat. And they had um, thought about actually canceling it. And I, I want to bring up this idea of the ground swell, a deep undulation of the ocean often caused by a distant storm or earthquake, a sudden gathering of force. Now, I think about this gathering of force, or this undulation that's taking place in terms of the world that our kids are growing up in. And um, basically, um, I'm just looking at the comment. I think this is the East Coast. I got it right from the Quicksilver site. Um, the sudden gathering of force in terms of the social media and, and what's going on in the context of our world is um, a powerful force. And a couple of days later, I had mentioned that I um, was a lifeguard <laughs> you know, and before, but um, you know, one of the things that people do is when they come down to the beach, especially here in Long Island, is they ask you, well, when's high tide? You know, and, um, because what they want to do is they want to set up their blanket in just the right spot so that they got the best view of the beach. And they... Um, you know, aren't going to get their blankets wet. But what happens is there is this force, and eventually the ocean does come up. And they start to get really creative in terms of blocking the ocean, right? So let me just share a couple examples here. I've seen people, you know, have their four-year-old, this happens to be my son, kind of take a bucket or take a shovel and start digging a, um, you know, a long hole or building a wall as if the ocean is going to be blocked by that hole. And then I've seen other strategies. Some people take this a step further and they get really creative. They'll take a uh, surfboard or they'll take a boogie board and they'll um, put it um, right up against the blanket as if the ocean is going to stop, um, be stopped by this, this uh, surfboard or the, or the boogie board or, or the little wall. And we all know the, the end of the story here. You know, so we can put up these barriers, we can put up these blocks, and we can kind of try to you know, hold this thing back, this force. But what ultimately happens is this. Um, and I wasn't able to capture all these pictures on the same day, but th this happens to be a picture of the ocean having come all the way up. And um, before you know it, my point is, is that we're up against the dunes with nowhere to go. The ocean is a powerful force. Social media is a powerful force. It's got amazing opportunities for us as learners, for us to kind of change education, we have to do so uh, in, a, in an intelligent way. And um, I think it's powerful. Now, again, another thing from, here from John Seely Brown means, towards the end of this, he says, embracing change means looking forward to what will come next. And I think we have to do that for our kids. I think we need to um, you know, start to shift our conceptual lenses. I think we have to really focus on change leadership that's going to allow us to kind of accelerate these sort of practices. Um, and I'm further than reminded about this idea of, you know, the, the, the penguins going back to our iceberg is melting and the idea of, um, you know, kind of taking that leap of faith and go on, jump in, and, um, you know, why not get connected? You know, social media is here to stay. I believe there's great opportunity for learning. I believe there's great opportunity for us as educators to kind of change the way we do and rebuild our organizations. Um, I think we have to do that. So I want to allow a couple time, a couple minutes we for do, questions. We do, and we'll want to finish with a minute or two so people can get the, um, the first um, set of uh, regular sessions, sessions for the conference. Like so if you have a question um, for have Bill, about 10 minutes, you can uh, click on the right hand here? icon. It's the third icon over in the participant window, and it lets you raise your virtual hand, and you can, we'll give you the microphone. The recording of this session will be up in about 10 minutes after the session is over, and you can uh, download the slides from the recording. You can also go right now to File, Save, the whiteboard, and you can save it as a PDF. So if we have a question for Bill, please feel free to raise your virtual hand, and we'll give you the microphone. Or put your question in the chat if you'd like.
There is a recording link on the conference website. It went up uh, about 12 hours ago. We don't want to confuse people by having it up too early, but there is a link to the recordings, and as soon as the recording is done, the links for that recording will actually work. So uh, in about 15 minutes, the link for, for Dr. Brennan's session will be up, and then as the session is complete, those recordings go live. We're getting a lot of appreciation here. There was a question from from Bob, but I'm not sure I understand it. What will you be doing next, Bill, maybe? Maybe your regular job? Uh, <laughs> I'm actually off this week. Um, and I, I actually came to the office because um, when I've done a webinar before, I've had tiny little hands coming underneath the door <laughs> trying to get to Daddy. Okay, we'll make a final call for questions here. Feel free to raise your virtual hand. That's the third icon over in the participant box. Let me give you the microphone or you can put a question in the chat. The song wonders, if someone's not involved with social media, where's one place to go or what is one thing they can do to get started? Something that doesn't overwhelm them too much. Um, who was that, Steve? Was there, um, were they, are they a principal or? Uh, it doesn't say. Well, you know, I've, I've really thought about just, you know, kind of jumping into Twitter, you know, and, and starting to connect with, um, those folks of, of like minds, you know, and just kind of dabbling in that. And, you know, one of the strategies that I've always used is, well, if I'm interested in following, you know, um, somebody like um, George Carlos, you know, or, um, or anybody, and you know, I wonder who are they following, you know, and, and that kind of has helped me kind of build my capacity to learn. Um, but I think Twitter is a great place to start, or even Facebook in terms of, following certain people or organizations that um, they're interested in. And, and Steve is, you know, there's nothing better than your website classroom 2.0 for, uh, for educators in terms of sharing resources. Great, everybody's answering that. Yeah, we're getting some answers in the chat as well. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Uh, I was trying to keep up with the chat session at the same time, but it does get a little difficult. Yes, there's an art to watching all of this, isn't there? So the Sharon asked about uh, the, the saving of the whiteboard. Don't save it as a whiteboard file. There's a drop-down that lets you save it as a PDF, and that's what you want to do for saving the, the presentation pages. Okay, thanks, Bill. That was terrific. So glad to have you kicking us off today. Uh, we did get some notes about your Twitter name. Feel free to put contact information there. I think your Twitter name is actually in your. Yeah, I used it as my name um, up in the uh, in the top section there. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Peggy. Folks, okay, in about five minutes, the next set of sessions starts. Thanks to Bill. I'm clapping for you virtually. I'm covering over the smiley face and going down to the applause icon. It's not easy to find, but terrific way to start our day. Thanks to you. Steve, thanks thanks so for much. Being here. Thanks for all, all the work you're doing, Steve. It's uh, great stuff. So glad. Okay, so the next set of sessions starts in five minutes. Go to schoolleadershipsummit.com or adminduzero.org. Look for the schedule in your time zone, and have a great day. Take care, everybody. Bye now. Bye, Bill. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye.